let's wait just uh, one or two minutes before we start. So you can you turn on the sound then? Is that right? It's on, yes. So whenever you're ready, let's just wait maybe a few more attendees. Let's say in one minute, let's start. Okay, just Thank give you. the word. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's start, Tim. People will join along the way. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and greetings from Geneva. I'm uh, Professor Timothy Swanson, the Andre Hoffman Professor of Environmental Economics at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Tonight, the Center for, Interdisciplinary, for International Environmental Studies is happy to present a talk by our newest professor, Professor Bill Adams, the Segre Professor of Conservation and Development. Bill joined us in January of this year, 2021, latterly of Cambridge University. He's been the chair and head of department at the Department of Geography, Geography at Cambridge University for many decades. I've known Bill and I know he was there in the 80s, so at least so long. Uh, Bill's going to be speaking to us tonight on the topic you see, the Strange Nature's conservation in the era of synthetic biology, an important and interesting topic that we're all looking forward to. He's also the author of a book of, uh, on the same theme, which will be forthcoming in the next month. Uh, and we'll hear more about this in a minute. I also would like to introduce Professor Mark Hufte, uh, Professor Titular of the Graduate Institute I uh, and a uh, chair in development studies who teaches as well in the area of conservation and development and who will be leading the questioning with uh, Bill uh, immediately after his talk of about 45 minutes. Before we proceed, I'd like to take this occasion of our inauguration of Bill Adams and the Claudio Segre Chair to thank Claudio Segre and the Segre Foundation for the uh, kind gift of the funding to be able to establish this chair and to bring Bill to Geneva. We're very happy and grateful to have received this. Finally, two last notes. Uh, you'll please note that we have a uh, recording in progress and you should be aware of this. Finally, uh, we're very happy to say that we have a large number of participants from across the Institute and across the world joining us tonight. Uh, heading upwards as I take a look at the picker into the 30s now, and I'm sure that we'll be uh, very uh, many more than that shortly, but I will allow Bill to take the floor now and thank him for coming and giving us this talk this evening. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. The Segre Foundation for enabling me to be uh, to spend some time here in Geneva, which I'm really enjoying. Um, what I want to do today is to talk about uh, the implications of the advances in the technology and science of synthetic biology for conservation, for the conservation of wildlife or biodiversity. It's a very rapidly advancing field, and I think it's something that uh, those of us who work in conservation um, don't know a great deal about. I know rather more than I did, as I'll explain, but I'm still uh, working in a field very far from my own. I'm a, I'm a social scientist trained as a geographer. 
So how to start this explanation? Well, let me kick off by sharing with you a paper which came across uh, my uh, digital desk uh, back in March this year. Uh, it's a paper led by a team, or written by a team uh, led from uh, 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 Edinburgh, um, an outfit that's most famous, the Roslyn Institute, most famous for uh, cloning of a sheep. Dolly the sheep was their creation. This is from the same, the same stable. It has a dreadful title, the novel combination of CRISPR-based gene drives eliminates resistance and localizes spread. I've learned to take such uh, titles uh, on the run. What it's about is invasive species. And invasive species is a much more familiar topic uh, for conservationists to be concerned in. Invasive species are among the largest threats to biodiversity worldwide. They're the, probably the biggest uh, cause of extinctions over the last five centuries. And uh, what the paper offers is what they describe as a humane, efficient, species-specific and cost-effective method of control. So despite the unattractive, to me, unattractive title, um, it's something which is of direct conservation relevance. This is the species they're interested in or concerned about. It's the grey squirrel. Um, it's a North American mammal. It was introduced into the UK from the US in the late uh, 19th century, um, merely for fun. Somebody thought it was a, would be great to have this cute animal around. And it loved it. It expanded its range steadily, uh, coming out from the south of England and from London. And there are now about two and a half million gray squirrels in the UK. And uh, you can see the map at the bottom, the gray area is spreading, uh, 1945 on the left, still restricted to the south, uh, 2000 uh, in the middle, moved a long way north through Wales and England and into, into Scotland. The problem is the grey squirrel is quite economically damaging, estimated to cost £14 million per year in damage to forestry trees and deep poverty. They love getting into people's roofs and chewing up all the electrics. More seriously, as the grey squirrel has expanded, the native red squirrel has declined. And you can see on the map the area in red is the, is the distribution of the red squirrel. And it's shrunk as the grey has expanded. So this is the native species. Um, and uh, there seems there's been a lot of research over decades about the, the nature of the competition for space between the two animals. It now seems, as I, as I read, that uh, it's thought the biggest problem is that the grey squirrel has brought with it a disease, squirrel pox, to which it has some resistance and the red squirrel has not none. But the fact remains that as the grey squirrel has expanded, the red squirrel shrinks. And you can see the 2010 map uh, here at the bottom, um, how small the areas of, uh, of red squirrel distribution are. The orange bits are where they overlap. And in those orange areas, the red squirrel population is declining. So this is bad news if you're a conservationist. And the red squirrels are more than just an ordinary animal because it also has a huge uh, cultural resonance in the UK, largely because of this book, which is by uh, a, a, an author called Beatrix Potter, published more than a century ago, still in print, the most enormous, enormous print run, about a, a red squirrel and its um, uh, wild adventures uh, in the British Lake District. So there has been for uh, many decades uh, a program of controlling grey squirrels using various methods, including shooting and trapping and poisoning. The di diagram at the top is from the Forestry Commission's guidance on how to kill grey squirrels. And the, pic the picture at the bottom is from a newspaper article about um, uh, citizens going out and uh, trying to kill uh, squirrels. They're so concerned about their spread. So the paper that Faber and, and the colleagues offered it was a new approach, and it was approach based on a CRISPR-based gene drive. So what's that? What's a gene drive? Well, a gene drive is a sequence of DNA that increases the likelihood that a given genetic characteristic will be passed from one generation to the next. Mendelian inheritance gives a 50% chance, and a gene drive increases that. And if a genetic element is attached to a gene drive, then that gets passed on. The gene, the traits are, if you like, driven into the genomes of all individuals in a population. Now, gene drives occur naturally, but they're increasingly being created artificially by gene editing. And what Faber and his team did was basically develop a set of different forms of gene drive that cuts a target site in the coding sequence of the female fertility gene. So they cut it, it repairs itself, but the function is disrupted. 
So female offspring are infertile. And what they showed is by modeling is that if you do this, the population will slowly decline because the an increasing proportion of the females are infertile. So by introducing um, uh, squirrels into a population which have this uh, genetic modification, they could, in theory, drive the species extinct. Does it work? Well, it's a modeling study and the modeling suggests that it would. Um, they showed they tried various population sizes, various models for how squirrels mate, uh, and uh, they showed that it would push a population to extinction between about uh, tw in between about 12 and 30 years. And the paper is a description of um, what uh, what models, what changes to the genome they envisage could be made and what the effects of them would be. So how should we think about this? How should conservationists think about the capacity to reach inside the genome to change the genetic structure of living wild organisms? One way of thinking about it is that synthetic biology is simply a new tool for conservation. That's how it's offered in the paper. And here's a, another article by a, a set of conservation scientists precisely talking about this, a new toolkit for conservation. How do we get this stuff out there? At the same time, if it's a tool, what are the consequences of its use? How do conservationists think about the consequences of its use? And who should make decisions about its application? So you have all this science being done, it's uh, complicated and obscure, and its implications are very profound. This is something I've been thinking about for the last uh, two or three years. I've been writing this book called Strange Natures, like the title of the talk, um, and uh, uh, trying to talk through uh, and uh, think through uh, the consequences and the implications of this. It's a collaborative project with uh, uh, a friend, an American uh, conservation biologist, Kent Redford. This is him in happier days when we were still only halfway through the book and before we came completely um, drawn and grey haired as a by consequence of the collaboration. But the book's shortly going to be out. It's got out in about, uh, about four weeks uh, and it's published by Yale University Press. So let me share some of the thinking that uh, we've gone into. First, let me say what I mean by synthetic biology. So let's start here uh, with Craig Venter, famous, um, I would say famous maverick biologist probably. Um, here he is in May 2010 uh, in Washington announcing the creation of a synthetic cell. You can watch this on, on uh, YouTube if you want, it's a TEDx uh, video. He said it's the first self-replicating species we've had on the planet whose parent is a computer. Well, it wasn't um, uh, exactly a synthetic cell. What he actually did was synthesize a chromosome from one bacterium, Mycoplasma mycoides, and transplanted it into another, Mycoides capricolium. But look at how he describes it. Starting with the digital code in the computer, building the chromosome from four bottles of chemicals, assembling that chromosome in yeasts, transplanting it into a recipient bacterial cell, and transforming that cell. The new bacterium he, that was nicknamed Cynthia, it has a more complicated official name, and its DNA had contained five words as watermarks, including the words Venter Institute, just in case you were in any doubt as to who had done this, who had done this work. Now, this sort of scientific capacity goes way beyond uh, the uh, long experience that humanity has with um, selective breeding. Uh, we've learned over uh, hundreds uh, of human and thousands of dog generations to create out of the wild wolf uh, domestic dogs, and we've made them of all kinds of different sizes. Um, many of those changes are actually quite um, quite small. They, the change in the appearance of the animal doesn't, doesn't have such a huge effect on the entire genome. Probably these two dogs could mate with the wolf if they could persuade it to hold off eating them for long enough. But gradually through the 20th century, we've got better and better uh, at, or more and more ambitious in, in, in the ways we've, uh, we've changed uh, the genomes of the species. So we changed the genome of the wolf into the dog by selective breeding. We chose an animal, uh, we chose it for its traits or, or a plant, 
uh, and then we we selected the ones that had the traits we wanted and we bred them again. And that's how we've done animal and plant domestication. It's how we've done plant breeding until the 20th century, when we started to use a whole series of new methods to make changes faster. Uh, they tried, we tried, for example, irradiating uh, seeds in order to stimulate uh, new genetic uh, forms uh, which would have different characteristics, rather a random process. In the 1980s, we started a much more specific forms of genetic engineering, um, but, uh, inserting uh, new DNA into the DNA of, of existing species. One of the techniques is a gene gun, literally a gun with a piece of DNA on the end, which is shot into a cell. It's quite a loose targeting process, and it can be focused either on work in the same species or across species transgenically. You could, in theory, take the genes from, um, from uh, a jellyfish and insert them into those of a wolf. Um, what the consequences would be uh, is, uh, uh, frankly, at, at that level, anybody's guess. But if you use the same technique in wheat or rice, uh, you could get, you could start to think, uh, start to get quite precise about the impacts. And that led in the 1990s to the introduction of genetically modified organisms, GMOs. Um, it was done mostly by <clears throat> large uh, biotech uh, uh, corporations. It was focused on um, commercially important crops uh, like tobacco, um, uh, like the famous Roundup Ready corn and soybeans that uh, were developed by, by Monsanto. Um, uh, these were, these were uh, varieties of crops that were resistant to pesticides uh, so that you could apply, you could kill everything except the crop by applying a broad spectrum herbicide. And bizarre sorts of applications or bizarre to me, like, like the glowfish, which has um, as genetic material from uh, from jellyfish uh, inserted into aquarium fish uh, to make them glow in the dark and you can buy them yeah you could go home tonight go on the internet and buy one um, uh, and uh, that's also created by this sort of process now that's uh, old technology the new technology is much more um, subtle um, it's much more powerful it's much more specific, focused, accurate, and it builds on the uh, scientific developments in the last decades of the last century, uh, mapping the genetic structure of the genome of different species. We started with very simple species and we got gradually more complicated, going uh, from viruses and algae into multicellular uh, animal uh, organisms like Arabidopsis, which is a, a small plant, and then into animals, Drosophila, the fruit fly, and of course the human genome, which was finally uh, um, described in, in uh, by 2003. So mapping the genome is the first thing. The second was editing it, learning to go inside those coils of DNA and actually change them. And that depends on a technology called CRISPR-Cas9. What's this? Well, 2007, it was discovered that bacteria remember attacking viruses. And what they do it by taking a piece of the RNA of the virus and sticking it into their own DNA. Um, and that enables them to find and cut the, the genetic material of returning viruses. And these chunks of, of, of DNA are called clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats, CRISPRs. And CAS is a CRISPR-associated system. And CRISPR-Cas9 is one of a family of different kinds of techniques for slicing DNA. 2012, it, uh, the, it started to be applied to genome editing. It's turned from being something that we discovered bacteria could do to something we discovered that scientists could do. 2015, science called it the breakthrough of the year. And 2020, uh, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier shared the Nobel Prize for Chemistry for this discovery. What does it do? Well, a piece of DNA directs what they call a Cas nuclease to a specific sequence in the genome where it generates a break. It chops into the strands of DNA. Uh, and this, this chunk can be directed to almost any DNA sequence by expressing the right piece of RNA. So you can find a place in the DNA. If you know what, how it's mapped, you can find a specific sequence and cut it. 
that enables you to insert new DNA in the place or to delete pieces of ge genetic material or simply to cut it and silence the gene. Um, and, and the describing it this way, I mean, gene editing is, is the way it's described. People talk about it as like, like editing a sentence with a word processor to delete, detect, delete words or correct spelling mistakes. But it's a, it's a, that is a very powerful metaphor. It's just like editing a, editing a document, but actually it's, it's editing the DNA of an organism. So this is what synthetic biology is built on, reading and writing DNA. You can take a natural cell, you can remove its genomic DNA, you can put it in a device called a sequencer, and you can work out what it, what the order of all the bases in the DNA, all those uh, those bases around the twisting helix, you can work them all out. And then you've got the program and you can put it in the computer. Once it's in the computer, you can decide to change something. Having changed it, you, so you can make a new design, you can fiddle with the design in the same way that you can fiddle with the text of a word process document. Then you put it into another machine course, which synthesizes the DNA. Then you stick it in yeast. You can stick that into a transplanted cell and you get a synthetic cell. So you can read and write DNA. That is what synthetic biology is based on. It's new and it has enormous potential. Science rather nicely put it in 2015. It's only slightly hyperbolic to say that if scientists can dream of a genetic manipulation, CRISPR can now make it happen. So what about, where is synthetic biology going? Well, basically synthetic biology is about engineering that process, bringing modern engineering principles to the design and construction of living systems, as Rob Carlson uh, put it. If you like, it's treating the elements of life as a kit of parts, treating DNA as a kit of parts, imagining the DNA as a kind of uh, a box of Lego pieces, thinking about it like that. So you think about DNA sequences with defined functions. What do they actually do? And then you think about them making them so they conform to an assembly standard. And then you can think about putting them together into what, they, what synthetic biologists talk about as biological circuits or devices that can be incorporated into living cells. And you standardize all of this. So you can buy chunks of DNA which do particular kinds of things. You could buy a piece of DNA that, that, that causes a bacterium to fluoresce off the internet uh, if you wanted to. And uh, it has opened up uh, an extraordinary explosion of activity in all kinds of levels. There is, for example, the something called IGM, the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, which was started at MIT back in 2003 with a, with a, as a summer project for students. In 2019, it had 300 teams from 40 different countries, six and a half thousand uh, young people. And they're making biological devices. They're making algae that, uh, that eat pollutants, or they're making algae that turn a funny color. Uh, they're, they're, they're fiddling with the way in which things work. And as Rob Carlson says, the era of garage biology is upon us. This is from one of the websites I was looking at the other day. Teach your child or students to engineer biology. Hands on. Here's a kit. You can buy that kit. Or this one I really like. The DNA Playground Starter Set. So those of you who may have grown up with chemistry sets in your youth, that's very old hat. Now you want a DNA set. And you can actually fiddle with it on your kitchen table if you want. And so synthetic biology is a, a, um, a set of technologies, a set of methods, a set of principles built on this sort of tech startup culture, garage biology, but garage biology is attracting investors very fast. As Thomas Vanderbilt wrote in this article, biology is the new software. Let's do with living things uh, what people did with computers and with the internet. Um, and people sometimes talk about DNA as software that writes its own hardware with the hardware. It's a very big market. Um, it's, it's, of course, there's a lot of uh, boosting talk around, but the cost of DNA synthesis is falling very fast. The bottom graph here from Nature talks about the cost of genome sequencing. At the time of the human genome sequencing, it was costing uh, something like uh, maybe up to $100,000 to sequence uh, a genome. It's now down to um, under $10,000. And investment is very fast. The global biotech market is estimated 
that's something like 700 billion US dollars, and it's predicted to grow at the rate of 16%. Um, the, the rate it grows is partly a, a reflection of support from certain governments, particularly uh, India and China. It's very fast moving. And it has a huge range of applications um, uh, in a number of different fields. This is a, the quote here from uh, Venki Ramakrishnan, who was the, uh, the um, uh, chair of the British Royal Society in 2017, speaking at the AAS conference in the US, he talked about a new age of biology based on genetic technologies. So it, applications are widespread in human medicine about uh, repairing defective genes, methods to destroy cancer, novel pharmaceuticals. There's applications in public health about insect vector control. Applications in agriculture to promote uh, crop yields and disease control, and in biofuels and biopharma and all sorts of other areas. Most of these things, many of these, some of these things are being driven as the medicine would be uh, in part by what is seen to be good for human welfare. They're also being driven by what looks profitable. There's a lot of people investing in this field. Um, and if you think about what the purpose of, uh, a, a, of a CRISPR uh, pig is, it probably isn't to be good to pigs. And right down the bottom, the conservation of biodiversity. This is not a field with lots of investment, but nonetheless, it's a field where people are talking about the same technologies. So what are they talking about? Well, the first is in the area of the control of invasive species. I've mentioned it with the grey squirrel, but there are much more serious problems, uh, such as those of mice and rats on oceanic islands. Uh, this is the island of South Georgia in the South Atlantic, on the edge of the Antarctic. Uh, it has both, it has, um, Rats had rats on it and mice, actually, um, which were causing damage to seabird populations. And they spent $11 million, $100 per hectare, getting rid of them. What if you could do that genetically and engineer a gene drive? Uh, it's like the one for squirrels, perhaps, that would uh, drive all the population to be male or female so they could no longer reproduce. Something of that sort. Maybe a genetic technique would be quicker, easier, cheaper. The way they did it on South Georgia was dropping large uh, amounts of uh, rat poison right across the island. Um, and that's hugely expensive. And they're obviously in many parts of the world, that would be quite a risky procedure. And this is not just a niche activity. This is something which potentially the killing of invasive species is a major industry, you might almost say, um, particularly um, uh, important in New Zealand. Um, where the government has set a goal for a predator-free country by 2050, predator-free New Zealand. And a lot of, of scientists there are very interested in genetic techniques to do that. There's also a number of applications being talked about uh, around um, wildlife disease, um, kichromycosis, I can't say it, kichromycosis, for example, which is killing amphibians. Um, it's a fungal disease. Um, it interferes with the with the frog's uh, the amphibian skin. It's causing extinctions in many countries of the world. No one quite understands how it would work. And there's a lot of interest in saying, well, could you actually um, could you actually engineer uh, the biology of the frogs, or engineer the biology of the microbes that live on the skin of the frogs uh, to give them greater resistance to these diseases? And so there are. You will find a literature uh, discussing whether that is possible um, uh, and start and say, if it were possible, uh, would it be uh, desirable? The same sort of techniques applied to other diseases like white nose syndrome in North American bats, which has caused the deaths of millions of bats since 2012. It's a fungus uh, which attacks them when they're in hibernation over the winter and they don't recover. Or another species, a very cute animal called a black-footed ferret, which is thought was thought extinct actually uh, in the middle of the 19th century and rediscovered in the 1980s, lives in North America. Um, and it's the very small wild population is uh, very susceptible to um, sylvan plague. Um, and uh, they're talking about whether they could actually engineer the genome to give the, uh, the animals protection from it. There's also another another product which is trying to sort of to broaden it uses similar sorts of techniques to broaden the, the genetic base because it the, the population of ferrets dropped to such a low level uh, that the genome is quite restricted. Or a, another uh, application that's been discussed is against avian malaria in Hawaii. Hawaii 
isolated islands, large numbers of endemic species, and uh, more than half of the endemic birds of the island have gone extinct in the last couple of centuries. There's lots of causes of that, including um, habitat loss and other things, but one particular cause uh, is avian malaria and avian pox virus spread by mosquitoes. The diseases and the mosquitoes introduced to Hawaii. Um, so there are, there are species on Hawaii that cause human diseases like uh, Zika virus, or that carry them, I should say. Um, but the, the particular application that's, that's being thought about is against the species that carries avian malaria. How do you control it? Well, conventional control with insecticides and reducing habitat for mosquitoes is, is it's, it's expensive, it's difficult. There's the possibility of using a sterile insect technique, releasing sterile males to overwhelm the wild population. You, that's quite well established in pest control. Uh, it involves irra irradiating uh, um, males and then releasing them. But also suggestions about engineering a gene drive to achieve the same kind of thing. So that's that's been discussed. There was a meeting uh, in Hawaii in 2016, um, which recognised that there were a lot of concerns within Hawaii about the uh, about these kind of ideas, and they kicked it into the long grass to have a good long think about it. My point is simply that it's there and it's being considered. There are also a series of applications relating to um, uh, promoting adaptations to the Anthropocene, if you want to use that word empowering nature to resist the changes that humans are causing. So, for example, climate, one impact of climate change is ocean warming and ocean um, acidification. And uh, the big, there's a big impact of that on corals. And so uh, there's a lot of interest, particularly in, in Australia, in the possibility of um, uh, developing um, varieties of coral which have resistance to warmer water. Such varieties exist, for example, in Hawaii, where they exist around um, uh, volcanic vents uh, in the sea floor, and they can cope with warmer temperature. So could you look at the genomes of those corals, sequence them, find out which genes give them the resistance uh, to warmer temperatures, and then insert those genes into the corals in, in Australia? I mean, it's brilliant, it's mad, it's, uh, it's novel, it's being talked about. And there's lots of other kinds of applications uh, around climate change, uh, biofuels from synthetic algae, uh, synthetic meat, um, uh, using uh, these kind of techniques to generate uh, meat substitutes, or uh, uh, developing new um, organisms, uh, algae, for example, uh, which are good at breaking down pollutants. So there are a lot of suggestions out there for these kinds of things. And the last of them is um, the idea of de-extinction. The last and the maddest, really. Uh, could one bring back a species uh, from extinction? Um, and a lot of the techniques uh, that are being talked about involve uh, cloning. Beth Shapiro wrote this very nice book in 2015 on, on the possibility of cloning a mammoth. And she concluded you couldn't uh, because not enough DNA has survived. But there is a, there is a project in the US um, talking about the possible uh, experimenting with the possibility of uh, editing the uh, the genome uh, in, inside the cells of Indian elephants uh, to create um, sequences which resemble those of mammoths. And it's not inconceivable that if enough money were thrown at this, uh, you could get to, uh, you know, a very hairy, cold tolerant uh, Indian elephant. You could start to sort of see something that looked like a mammoth. Is this the kind of thing that conservation should be uh, spending uh, its, its money on? It's a slightly bizarre idea. But as you can see from the talks, the books uh, and this rather nice cover from the National Geographic magazine, um, you can see just how excited uh, the media uh, is about these kinds of ideas. So how should conservationists respond to synthetic biology? What should, as it were, the conservationist in the street think about the literature that's emerging about these kinds of techniques? There's been a lot of discussion. Um, I was involved with Kent with a conference back uh, in 2013 in Cambridge, trying, starting, I think, to ask the question about synthetic biology and conservation. And since then, the issue of synthetic biology has been addressed by uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, and by IUCN. 
Uh, Kent was involved in leading a report and an assessment of uh, synthetic biology and conservation published in 2018. And if it goes ahead, uh, the World Conservation Congress uh, this autumn um, in France will uh, have some discussion of it. So it's not something that's completely off the radar. Equally, I think it's not something that people are very well equipped to talk about. The two extreme positions among conservationists are probably these. The first is that it's a toolkit. So uh, this is a quote from a, one of many papers on this. Conservation biology needs a bigger toolbox. This is a tool. Conservation should use it. On the other hand, the notion that it's a Trojan horse, that it's dangerous, and in particular, that if conservation adopts these kind of techniques, they're playing into the hands of corporations who would like to use them for other purposes. I would say most strict, most scientists who are biodiversity conservationists tend towards the first of these two bullets, and most environmentalists tend towards the second of them, and that's where the environmental movement internationally is very strongly. Uh, and so, no to genetically engineered trees, uh, another slogan. The release of genetically engineered American chestnuts into forests would be a massive and irreversible experiment. All this from the website of the ETC group saying, has the synthetic biology industry hijacked IUCN? So this is becoming a very tense issue. It's an important issue. It's important it's discussed, but it's quite hard to discuss it. Well, it's quite hard to discuss it uh, dispassionately. People care enormously about it. There is increasing recognition of the need for caution. So Venki Ramakrishnan, when he spoke at the AAS conference uh, in 2017, said if advances in genetic technologies have put us on the verge of a new age of biology, we need to go into it with our eyes open. He's saying it's not just a matter of following the latest brilliant idea. We have to really think about it. The Economist in 2018 talked about gene drives and they had it right, I think. They promised great gains and great dangers. Don't ban, don't rush. A rational sort of thing you might expect the economist to say. I very much like their accompanying graphic, I might say. What did Faber and, and, and his colleagues say back with the squirrels? Well, he uh, um, pointed out that they had not done any experiments. There was no legislative framework in Britain for the release of gene drive organisms. So you couldn't, and you can't actually keep the squirrels in captivity uh, so that to experiment on. So really it was a desk study, of course, one that was designed, I think, to, to encourage further experimentation. What they said in that paper at the end of it was, the critical thing is public acceptance. The UK needs to see whether the public is receptive to the deployment of gene drive technology. And that I think is a key question. Do people, will people trust the science or trust the scientists? And there is of course research on this too. Um, uh, and it's, um, it's not unconnected to uh, issues um, around other areas of science. The Royal Society assessed public attitudes in 2017 and said how much people trust, uh, approve of the use of these technologies or feel warm towards them depends on what they're for. 80% of people approve the use of these technologies to treat incurable life-threatening conditions in humans. Uh, only 23% thought they should be used to create perfect fruit and vegetables or 28% to make cosmetic changes in animals. So people are quite sophisticated in saying, well, I, you know, if there's a, there may be risks, but it depends what you achieve, or what you gain on the side of the risk. They also showed, and I think this is quite critical, that trust in scientists depends on who employs them. So 43% of people trusted university researchers. That's not very many, by the way. That's the largest percentage. Basically, people didn't particularly trust scientists but only 16% trusted scientists working within business organizations or funded by businesses, which actually includes many of the trusted, many of the university researchers. So trust is something that's a real problem, and particularly with the heritage of things like uh, GMOs, um, it's going to be a very significant in, in, in the adoption of these sort of techniques. And without doubt, there are risks. Edited genomes can still evolve, uh, the genome editing of freely mobile species, such as wild species, takes place in unbounded ecosystems. Fields and pens and greenhouses and even islands are not contained spaces. 
And I put up this uh, clipping from the Guardian newspaper from 2017 to remind us that even something like an enclosed fish farm, fish farm include, uh, in North America are now able to use genetically modified salmon. Fish get out, they get out and they breed in the system. So you can now find um, the, the genes of farmed salmon in wild salmon populations. So that's an issue and you, uh, it's no good uh, pretending that it isn't. The kind of problems of contamination, if you want to call it that, coming through genetic introgression, through genetic material moving into wild relatives. Gene, genetic material moves in very complex ways. It's not just through inheritance, through, uh, through breeding. There can be ecological spread, the colonization by engineered organisms into new contexts, to places where a problem species is valued, for example. Uh, in Britain, we've long, farmers have long hated the rabbit, but the rabbit is a protected species in Spain. So what's to stop, as it were, uh, the spread of engineered species into the place where they're not supposed to be? And there's an issue around the prol proliferation of technologies. If you had the perfect way of getting rid of mice on a, on a tropical island, um, why would you not, uh, 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 or how would you stop the same technique being used in New York City uh, or, uh, or Geneva? So techniques developed for one context uh, could be used elsewhere. There's a lot of interest in risk uh, and risk management. Um, there are papers, uh, I particularly like the work of um, uh, Ronald Sandler, uh, Northeastern University, who writes really uh, sensibly, I think, about the ethics uh, and the risk uh, uh, profile of, of these kind of initiatives. And he says there has to be a very careful assessment around, uh, if this is specifically for conservation, about the goal of the project. Is it well justified? Secondly, means assessment, can the goal of the project uh, be accomplished responsibly? And lastly, is it desirable? And he hammers on the importance of oversight. Who has oversight of these kind of experiments? What's the role of the public in making decisions? Who enforces these things? Uh, and what about jurisdiction? This is an in, many species move internationally uh, and there is no international agreement on these technologies. The last thing I'd say on this is the fact that if this is not a matter for conservationists alone. It is not only conservation that is thinking of uh, editing uh, the genomes of wild species. There are proposals like the American chestnut, um, uh, with a, which has a, a gene introduced from wheat, which should give it might give, should give it resistance to to, fun, to the fungal um, disease that's been uh, that's wiped it out. But also in in agriculture, there's there's work on on pests which get about in public health. I mean, more than a billion um, uh, GM mosquitoes have been released uh, already in, in different countries. So the decisions of conservationists are important, but decisions about the use of synthetic biology will not be taken by conservationists alone. But there's one thing that is unique to conservation, and that is to think through what we think about this as a technology because conservation already uses a lot of draconian technologies of management. We cut, poison, shoot, burn uh, routinely as part of our, our uh, 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 part of our management of nature. We make nature natural in very unnatural ways. So one way of thinking about it is, well, in what ways is synthetic biology, is gene editing different? Synthetic biology reaches inside the genome to reshape the outcome of evolution. It feels different. How different is it? Well, let's contrast CRISPR and a chainsaw. Both are technologies. Both have serious biological and ecological impacts. Chainsaws cut one tree at a time. They're quite piecemeal. They're quite slow. And what they do is quite obvious to an observer. So if someone's cutting timber and shouldn't be doing it, there is the possibility of stopping them, complaining about it, discussing the management plan, et cetera, et cetera. CRISPR is different. It can reshape the whole genome. The changes are only observable by a scientist. The effects are not confined to one individual, but can persist down the generations. And for those reasons, I think it's obvious that there are different concerns about risk and the willingness of society to accept unknown technologies. And therefore, it's not surprising if people uh, choke on the, on the notion, this is just another tool. It's just a kind of chainsaw for the genome. It's okay, we know how to do this. I think it's new territory and new difficulties.
Kevin Esfeldt wrote in 2014, we may soon be able to alter not just domesticated species, but entire wild populations and ecosystems. And I have to say, I find that quite, a, it's, it's, it's exciting and very, very scary. For conservation, I think the key thing is, is what these techniques, technologies do to the distinction between the natural and the human transform. Because that underpins conservation. We protect nature against human-induced change. But how much change, how profound are the changes uh, that we can accept? Do genetic technologies disturb the boundaries between the natural and the artificial? Do they therefore make arguments about loss and irreplaceability less convincing? Do they offer new risks of biodiversity loss? Or are they just a cool tool? So those are really simple questions to express and really difficult ones to answer. We've had a go at it in our book uh, and I've tried to give you a, a flavor uh, uh, of the terrain that we've covered here. That's, that's me done, thank you. <laughs> Virtual applause. Thank you very much, Biel. Um, Good evening to everyone. I will be animating the question and answers session, uh, which will last some 20 minutes. Uh, please, if you have some questions, I will invite you to write them in the Q&A uh, section of WebEx, and I will transmit them orally to uh, uh, Bill. I will start myself by a question. Um, Bill, as you know from uh, conservation, uh, biological diversity and uh, life itself is about connections, no? And I always wondered about uh, animal culture, uh, for example, People are under the impression that it will be easy to revive extinct species, no? Uh, maybe a side effect of some popular movies. Uh, it may be possible in some years, but what about the animal culture? For example, uh, you've mentioned the example of uh, mammoths, no? But we know that elephants, they teach their of springs, they, they have a real culture, they have a language, they, they have practices, they, they, they have uh, routines, and uh, this is kind of uh, uh, shared with the offsprings. This is one example. If you revive, for example, tigers or uh, mammoths from nothing, what about the culture? So it's about connections. Another example, but you've mentioned many, no? Uh, it's that we focus, we always tend to focus uh, in conservation mostly on species and not on ecosystems. Most of the indicators of, uh, uh, for biodiversity or conservation is uh, with species, no? Uh, you count species. Um, but we know the real unit is ecosystems. So it's all about connections. You introduce a new species, as you mentioned, uh, genetically engineered. Uh, what about the effects and the consequences? So what about this, the, the connections, no? Yes. yes. Thank you, Mark. That's a, that's a, a, a set of really important questions. Um, you're exactly right to point to, I didn't talk a lot about uh, the idea of de-extinction, bringing animals back from the, from the, from extinction, but um, there are, and, and this is written in the literature about these things, there are people saying, wow, this would be cool, and there are people saying, no, it would be really stupid, and what a, what a waste of conservation money this would be, but I mean, the, the two obvious problems, if something went extinct, um, you, you've got to be sure uh, that it's not going to go, that it's, uh, it can survive. Uh, so, you know, it has space to survive. It has to have uh, a lack of threat to survive. 
So um, yes, you're exactly right. I mean, how could you possibly bring back something uh, or, or as um, complicated in its social system as a, as, a, as a mammoth? And indeed, what are the ethics uh, of, of experimenting on elephants in that kind of way? I mean, it's, it's a very, um, uh, that's a very, um, those are very profound questions, very important questions. I think um, there, is, there are moments when conservation is, uh, is very good at talking about uh, connectivity and the large scale and about ecosystems. And there are moments when it, it, uh, conservationists turn, in, turn into stamp collectors uh, and they become you know, immensely concerned about this particular species or subspecies uh, you know, and whole, you know, the, the effort it must take to, to stop it going extinct. And when they're in that mode, uh, then these kind of techniques start to be sort of more attractive because you know, they, 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 they like to feel the whole weight of sort of scientific endeavor can be focused on the, on the species. But you're right, the larger questions are, 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 really, um, are really important and really profound. Plus, I think uh, um, the the skepticism that ecologists have had for decades about simplistic, drastic solutions, uh, and so you know the notion that you you just need to do this and it'll roll and sort itself out. Uh, yeah, people are rightly skeptical about that. Thank you. We have no question at the moment. No question I can see. Uh, Tim, please. I'll go ahead and join in and give everyone a chance. We'll dominate for a second here. Uh, so I, following up on a, a bit on the idea of connections, but not so much the ecosystem, but the evolutionary system. Uh, it seems to me that a, a big part and it's often not discussed very much with regards to conservation, but that a fundamental purpose should be to try to conserve some substantial part of the earth where evolution is able to continue and continue to solve problems and generate solutions and generate different directions and so on. I'm a bit of a technological optimist and I'm not entirely against humans intervening. And so I'm not against doing some of these things in public health or in uh, agriculture where we intervene into the, ev into the evolutionary system. But I, I guess it strikes me as uh, uh, almost, you know, oxymoronic to talk about the idea of intervening into the evolutionary system to conserve concert, you know, uh, to conserve the evolutionary system. I could maybe just, I was trying to think of the most extreme circumstances, maybe where you, humans have introduced a huge technology, such a technological change, such as climate change. You might think, well, we have to do something equally technologically dramatic in order to counterbalance this. But it does seem that somewhat counter the entire idea of conservation to me, to be using, uh, especially if you're going to try to halt the evolutionary process, such as a disease, uh, you know, or to turn everything into a male. Uh, this is, is, seems to me an easy question in the cases, uh, in many of those that you mentioned. So I'm kind of curious about that. If, that, if you accept at all the idea that the idea of conservation is in part to make sure that evolution is able to play its fundamental role on Earth, then, uh, then we need to stay out of this maybe uh, when conservation is what it takes. Yeah, thank you, Tim. That's a very uh, thoughtful, uh, thoughtful contribution, and I think I, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think that, I mean, there is no rule book for conservation. We have, you know, a, an international convention, and we have organisations like IUCN, which coordinates and tries to link together. But there's no rule that says, you know, this is what conservation ought to be and what it shouldn't be. And therefore, people, you know, you, you have to understand what conservation is by looking at the different things people do. Um, and there is, you know, there are these sort of phenomena which uh, which we have, which is a which is a 
a very strong interest in particularly charismatic species that are becoming very endangered. Um, so, I mean, you can, I think mo many conservationists would not take quite the kind of uh, long term evolutionary view that you've espoused, although it's a very logical one. Um, I think that um, the, uh, I think that there is something that that these technologies are going to do to conservation. Uh, and I think it is that it's going to become, it's going to have to become sophisticated in thinking at the molecular level. And, and thus far, we've been quite sophisticated at thinking about taxonomy. We've been quite sophisticated thinking about ecology. Um, there's lots of other things, other areas of science we're not good at. But I think this is going to require us to answer questions about, you know, what's 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 natural and what's not, what's an okay thing to do and what isn't an okay thing to do that are at the genetic level. Um, and one thing I've noticed going to meetings where this this these issues are discussed, if you put in 2013, we put sort of synthetic biologists and conservation biologists in the same room. And I thought I'd be the odd person out because I'm not a biologist at all. Um, but actually, I realized that the people who do synthetic biology, they're either engineers who never did biology past school, or else they're biologists who gave up ecology in the first term because they didn't like it. And the bi conservation biologists were the same. They, they gave up genetics as soon as they could. And actually, there wasn't a great deal of scientific communication. So conservation science got a, has got a lot of catching up to do um, uh, and in order to have a, a, a good conversation about it. But I do think we need to be thinking about conservation in more in these evolutionary in the evolutionary frame. That is what matters actually. It's that it's that you know there is enough, if you like, crudely, there is enough living diversity uh, that 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 stuff goes on happening. Um, both uh, and both because some of it is useful to us, some of it is so-called ecosystem services, and we we need those. We kind of you know, we want the bodies to rot when we throw stuff away. Um, all those sorts of things we take for granted, but they're all ecosystem services of a sort, but also because that's a, a, an ethically right uh, position. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, interesting. Thank you, Bill. We have a question from Michael Atkinson. It's a double question. Latour encouraged us to love your monsters. <laughs> What does this mean in the context of synthetic biology? And building on this, what are the potential unintended consequences of the use of synthetic biology in conservation? Mm. Thank you, Michael. That's a good question. So Latour, Latour's essay, which is was designed to be provocative, as so much of what he does was, um, uh, was really, uh, I read it anyway, as, as, as encouraging uh, trying to persuade people not to take an unthinking, um, not to place the idea of nature or an uninfluenced, uh, a world uninfluenced by humans, not to put that into a sort of, uh, in, uh, into a shrine, uh, not to sort of to, to, but to accept that some of the things that come out of human engagements with non-human natures uh, that, that some of those things are are good uh, and can be can be loved. They ought to be loved. We need to engage with them, not just be afraid of them. And I suppose the question that's hardest for conservation about this is is I mean, how will we regard? How would we regard a genetically engineered species? I mean, it might be a species that's been engineered to enable it to survive a particular disease. Um, but would we would we see a difference between the authentic original and the new? Uh, or would we not? How would we classify it? What if it was a larger thing? What if, I mean, to use an extravagant example, what if there was a sponsor that said, I can, I can fix, I can give you enough money to protect every wild tiger in the world. It, it's going to cost you, you know, 200 billion pounds. I've got that. You can have that. Just one thing. I really think they should be blue and white, not orange and white. Um, that's probably not a change that would be difficult to, to effect. Uh, I mean, you know, that's a bit silly example, of course, but uh, I mean, what happens to those engineered animals? What happens if you get these sort of hybrids? How do we treat them? Um, so I think those are really interesting questions. The unintended consequences of the use of synthetic biology in conservation and on conservation. I think we have to keep those two things that, that most of the changes that will happen will not be done for conservation purposes. They will be done 
because uh, they are important to corporate profits or to uh, the uh, important areas of human concern, such as agriculture. Um, and they, they will have potentially will have consequences on ecosystem uh, function and diversity and conservation. So you need to be really attentive to those things. Um, uh, and, and then within conservation, I think the same, the same sorts of things. I think we need to, uh, to be really careful about, um, about uh, adopting, uh, adopting new technologies and, and applying them on the assumption that they'll work, uh, because I think often, uh, often when they won't. So I think there is a real risk of unintended consequences. At the same time, I don't think there's a perfect, uh, uh, I suspect there isn't a perfect uh, solution. Uh, the way I see it, these technologies are advancing very fast. They've been very adroitly managed uh, within the science uh, and governance community to try and avoid uh, the, the, the GMO problem as scientists see it. Um, you know, these techniques, gene editing was used to create some of the vaccines that are being used to uh, COVID vaccines. Um, and I think, um, uh, you know, we've already swallowed that one uh, in that small area. So I think there will be a lot of learning to be done and thinking to be done uh, as these techniques, as, as the pressure to adopt them uh, increases. Also, we, uh, this is my question, we, we have seen uh, with the case of biodiversity and uh, obviously the, the different uh, uh, legal uh, questions with biodiversity and the convention and global governance of biodiversity, that laws always la uh, lags behind the facts. And second, uh, that different states have different uh, perspectives. For example, the, the US blocked uh, uh, the, the convention in many aspects. Uh, so should we have, or is it, uh, I don't know, uh, is it required to to have a a kind of uh, legal setting at the global level for a, a synthetic biology? What would be your uh, no opinion on this point? Yes, so I mean that's obviously what um, the organs of the Convention on Biological Diversity hoped to achieve over the last ten years. Um, but have not done. And there are very different approaches to the regulation of this within different countries, different, for example, in the in the USA and in, in, in the EU, and now I'd say within, within the UK. And um, many of the advances are, are coming from, uh, from very other countries, um, India, China, Brazil. Uh, uh, these are technologies which, um, which are widely accessible. Um, and potentially scalable down to quite small scale. This is uh, these are things uh, unlike the the GMOs. I mean, these are things which you I think you call it a garage, but you could potentially do something uh, in your garage. Um, and so <clears throat> this is going to be very hard to regulate. Um, and I don't think many governments are really um, across the range of their responsibility. I don't think national governments are. Uh, are very aware of this. I've certainly spoken to civil servants in the UK who, who knew nothing really about uh, about the science, about the de debate about the science. So I think it's going to be very difficult um, to to see kind of regulation. Um, the sorts of things that are being talked about are whether you seek to regulate certain techniques or whether you seek to regulate certain kinds of products. There's a lot of interest in what they call trait-based regulation. Um, so whether you, you know, if you could achieve the same thing by, by crop breeding, but you can do it in this way quicker, uh, what's wrong? Um, uh, and so there's lots of arguments um, which need to be had, which will, which, which are complicated enough in scientific terms, but when you, when you then have to think of them in legal terms, it's very interesting. I mean, it does, it does change the whole regime set up in, in, in the Convention on Biological Diversity, N not least because, you know, because if you have the, if you have the computer program, you, you have the information, you know, you could conceivably make the product. It's, it's a, 
it puts it puts a lot of the debate about bioprospecting into a quite different sort of uh, sort of frame, I think, and um, uh, it's pretty hard to keep up. Very hard to think ahead. Um, um, yeah, very really difficult. We have a question from uh, Claude Martin. If we start from the assumption that once a technology exists, it will be sooner or later be applied. To what extent do you think this could divert from the still very urgent necessities of ecosystem based conservation? At least in the public opinion, this risk may be there that such new technology could be seen as panacea. Yes, thank you very much. That's a very good point. Um, uh, and uh, um, I think uh, I think there is a real risk of that. Um, I think that uh, I think you're right. That once the technology exists, it will sooner or later be applied. I think that's right. I think that is you know that's this one is going to be particularly difficult uh, to put back in the bottle or to keep in the bottle as it were because it is so uh, so potentially interesting to investors and and all sorts of other applications. Um, and I think that um, the notion I think it is a real problem for conservation that um, that. The simple message about you know need, about the need to protect nature uh, in the face of human demands. Um, I think I think the potential of the technologies makes that a slightly harder push. I mean, de-extinction is the obvious one. Why does the extinction of the species matters if if you can bring it back when you when you want to? That sort of argument uh, is um, at a at an incredibly crude level is is will be used. Um, and so I think there are real problems with distracting people from the very profound challenges of biodiversity loss um, associated with put this way, human lifestyles globally, the demands we make on the biosphere, which even in the years of COVID really haven't been dialed back much. So, you know, CO2, but also biodiversity loss, habitat loss, uh, pollution, et cetera. Um, uh, all of those problems um, are need to be solved uh, and conservation must not be distracted into thinking there is some kind of miracle solution. Uh, and that is a danger. We're talking about these things. It's very hard. I've done it myself in, in this talk. I, it's as if I'm saying, wow, this is a really cool thing that you could do. Yeah, well, it, you know, it's it's utterly novel and therefore it's intriguing whether it's actually um, useful, I think, is a is a really good question, not just for de-extinction, but for a number of the other applications. Um, yeah. I mean, so in conservation terms, if the only reason for using a genetic technique rather than a conventional technique is cost, I mean, yes, OK, but, it, you know, it's uh, uh, I'm not it doesn't seem to me that, uh, that that's a killer argument. Um, the danger is, of course, that you could probably raise the cost of doing the genetic work more easily than you could raise the cost of doing the conventional work, because the conventional work just looks difficult and slow and uh, expensive. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Um, there is Mathilde Pasta. Do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic with the development of RMNA vaccines uh, on the one hand and the theories that arose from the origin of the virus on the other, could they help bring attention on the synthetic biology <laughs> field? at an international level and encourage the international community to establish more regulations? Would more regulations be welcomed? Thank you, Mathilde, nice to see you. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think it will be interesting to see if anybody in the synthetic biology community uses the argument about um, the, the uh, the use of gene editing in the creation of vaccines uh, to, to show how useful and how efficient this is. Um, I, I think, I, I don't know, I mean, it seems to me the, the whole, there is a major problem internationally with 
um, let's say fear or suspicion of science, vaccine hesitancy, etc. There's a lack of trust in uh, in 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 science, even as science is 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 achieving more and more powerful sorts of techniques. Um, and so I think there's there are, the most likely thing is that the that the effect of, of, of COVID and the concern about vaccines and the concern about the origins of it and so on will, will actually just lead to a kind of phobia of laboratory science. Um, and I'm not sure that's, uh, that's going to be specific to the techniques of synthetic biology. Um, but certainly, you know, I mean, if, one, if, if people are minded to be, to be scared about these things, then there are things there to think very hard about. Um, just as if people are minded to try and solve, you know, really difficult global problems, um, then, then it's worth thinking about that too. So, for example, Target Vera is an organization that's, that's interested in using the possibility of using uh, gene drives to control malaria mosquitoes. Now, getting rid of malaria uh, from, let's say, the continent of Africa would be a really uh, a really exciting possibility it would Im mass massively improve people's lives. So that, that's an application which is being thought about, um, is being funded, um, and could could become a real offer, uh, a real decision point uh, for people. Um, Francine Francine Hughes is asking: uh, My genetically engineered wildlife become patentable? And what are its implications for conservation? If so, thank you. That's a that's a really a really good question. Um, yes, I think uh, potentially it, uh, potentially so. Um, so just as you can uh, so you can patent the uh, the the genetic uh, you can you can patent the the changes you create in a crop. Um, uh, or you can patent changes that you make in a, in a domestic animal. I think potentially you could do that with a wild species. And that's an interesting question as to whether that would happen. If you look at the literature on, on the extinction and just take the, um, the impossible question of the mammoth, it's inappropriate. But if you can imagine who might spend enough money to, to have a mammoth or have an elephant that looks like a mammoth, well, in a sense, that would be somebody who wanted to exhibit it, and that would to have, be able to patent it would be probably essential to that. So we're in this sort of we're in Jurassic Park territory. Um, but yes, I think the law on patent on the patenting of um, uh, of edited uh, wild species is something that really needs a, a legal scholar, not me, but also needs a lot of attention, a lot of thought. Thanks. That's what I meant by popular movies, no? Yes, yes. <laughs> patenting, patenting your discover, your discovery. But people are paying, I don't know, hundreds of millions for yacht, uh, for boats, so private boats. So why not uh, recreate a mammoth or a dinosaur? Yes. <laughs> Some species, no? Be quite tricky. Well, there are other species would be slightly easier, but uh, but yes, um, I don't think those things are in a realistic sense, in any realistic sense, conservation strategies. I mean, they're 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 things that 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 scientists talk about whether they can be done, the things people fiddle with it, but I don't think they would ever be a conservation strategy. I think to me that they're they're slightly beyond the beyond the limit of it. But it is the thing that catches the attention. Um, it's the thing that journalists like to talk about, and um, the notion of bringing back some species um, would be very interesting. So I think we will stop here. I will thank you very much for these uh, thought-provoking ideas. This is really an entire field that's opening to us. Tim, would you like to say a word of conclusion yes i'll conclude by again thanking both professor mark hofty and the segre professor of conservation and development bill adams we're very happy and grateful to have you here thank you very very enlightening and very interesting talk uh, we're most uh, happy to have had it Thank you all, and uh, we look forward to having you at our next, next talk uh, in the CIS discussion series. Thank you very much.
Bye now. Have a good evening. Thank you, Bill.